What's going on guys? This is our gospel video part two. And we're going to talk specifically today in regards to how you speak the gospel to somebody who claims to be a believer. Uh, I don't know where y'all live. I live in Ohio. And in Ohio, we have a lot of proclaiming believers. Uh, Ohio is full of a bunch of very introverted to themselves people, at least in public. Um, I know depending on where you are on the country, that's, that varies. Some places are very flamboyant and outgoing. Some are very introverted and, and kind of to themselves. So it just kind of depends on where you, where you go. You get different kinds of things. And that will uh, potentially... Um, help determine your ability to talk to somebody about Jesus or, or rather uh, how easy, easily they're receptive to whatever it is that you have to say. We have a lot of people who don't like to give even a lot of backlash. And again, it depends even in the city, in our specific city where you go. And Ohio is not all the same. Like Columbus is way less a Christian than Cincinnati even is. But in the Cincinnati area, even depending on where you go, you'll get different answers consistently. But um, the predominant crowd I'm around and see, they don't generally confess to atheism um, or agnosticism or really any other core religion. It's generally, I believe in God is the answer you'll get. Or I go to church. I just got that answer two days ago, I think. Um, I go to church. And the job for us to those people is... Um, they are believing that they're doing well spiritually. And um, this is a very, very popular pagan universal belief that I believe in a higher power, therefore I'm good to go. This needs exposed just as badly as an atheist needs to be exposed in their deception. Um, and the way that you do it is going to be more difficult, I think, um, than a lot of times talking to non-believers. Now, now this isn't always the case, um, but I find that I, I've talked to way more believers or proclaiming believers, false converts. So that's the phrase I'll use for them. It's the easiest phrase to use. False converts, people who think that they converted to Christianity but actually did not. I speak to more false converts than any other group of people. Um, and then the next would be, you know, probably believers and then just straight up proclaiming non-believers would be last just because of the quantity of them. It's not because I chose to speak to one more than the other. So my, my predominant mission as a Christian currently in the, where I live is talking to proclaiming believers who actually do not believe in Jesus. There's a few routes that I go generally when I speak to these people and a lot of it depends on how well I know the person. <clears throat> um, and if I know them really well, I can go into a much more um, in-depth conversation. Obviously, that's just kind of common sense. But now to get into more of the specifics of this. If I walk up to somebody and I say, hey, man, I, I often start out my conversations like you'll see in the video below. Uh, hey, is there anything you need prayer for? To which I'll often get the answer, no. Um, and I'll go, okay, awesome. Well, hey, man, is there any, uh, uh, you know, where are you at with Jesus? That's usually the next question I'll ask is where are you at with Jesus? Like, do you believe in him? Do you think he's a fairy tale? Do you think the whole Bible story is just a hoax? Are you an atheist? Kind of give them, I want to open the floor up to them to be able to tell me what they believe. I don't want them to feel like they're pressured by me to say, yes, I'm a Christian because I'm a Christian. I don't want them to feel that way. And then they will say, no, I, yeah, I'm, a, I'm a believer. Uh, or yeah, yeah, I go to church. And then I go one of two routes. It kind of depends on where I feel led to go in that moment. Sometimes I'll just encourage them in that. Um, again, it kind of that depends on how I believe they perceive or how I perceive their understanding of the faith. Sometimes I'll just encourage them and I'll go, Awesome. Well, hey, that's super awesome if you are a believer. Remember what Jesus says. We're supposed to be preaching the gospel to all creation, and we're supposed to be in his word every single day, learning about him, growing in relationship with him, because if not, we're living in disobedience. Um, I want to be really pointed with these things. Um, that one is much more of an encouragement and just you know letting them know, hey, here's where we need to be. But I want to be really pointed with these things because it's really easy for people to wiggle out of answers like this. Are you a believer? Do you believe in Jesus? Oh, yeah, I believe in Jesus. Well, yeah, most of everybody believes in Jesus. So that's not really a great question to ask to get your answer. Uh, well, well, do you take your faith seriously? You know, there's another question I hear people ask. Almost everyone's going to say, oh, yeah, yeah, I take my faith pretty seriously. I go to church. Okay, well, like, 
That doesn't really help me either. And asking if they participate or serve at their church is also not a great answer because that does, does nothing for their faith. Nothing. You know, Jesus never asked you to serve at your church. He asked you to be the church. So what I like to ask is really pointed questions you can't wiggle out of. Yeah, oh, I'm active in my church. What does that mean? Does that mean you serve at church? You go to church? You're door greeter? Born again? Like that, none of those things are all ambiguous is the point that I'm getting at. I like to ask questions that are really pointed right in your face. Not mean, not rude, not harsh, not belligerent, but in your face questions that you can't wiggle out of. Like this. I will ask generally three questions. Do you read your Bible every single day without fail? Second question I'll ask is, do you fellowship with believers on a weekly basis outside of church? Third question I'll ask is, do you share your faith with the lost on a regular basis? I don't like to give a specific like weekly, monthly, daily, because I don't want to get legalistic there. But that's the third question I'll ask. Do you share your faith regularly with lost people? Do you share the gospel with the lost people? Those you cannot really wiggle out of the questions of. Um, uh, you know, in, in a more pointed way, I like to ask the third one is how many times in the past week have you preached the gospel? Or how many times in the past month have you preached the gospel to a lost person? And that usually will give you a really good gauge of where that person's at spiritually. So those are the questions that I personally ask to people. Again, I don't, I don't find those specific three questions anywhere mentioned by anybody else in scripture. But because, and, and by the way, just, just so you know why that is, nine times out of 10, the people that that these people are speaking to are Jews. And these Jews know their Bible extremely well. They know their Hebrew Bible really well. So that's why you see Peter and Paul often will quote from the Hebrew Bible instead of um, asking them if they read it. It's, it's generally implied that they read it because like, you know, Paul will be in synagogues or at a temple um, talking to people, generally he's at the temple, talking to people. So obviously they know the word or they would not be there because back then it wasn't like it is today in regards to this whole um, consistent um, lukewarm people, like, like the, the people could be living spiritually lukewarm, but their knowledge, their knowledge is generally really precise because they're grown up that way. They're trained that way. Like they go to school. Like imagine going to Christian school today, uh, which uh, Christian schools don't really teach the Bible today, but, um, that's not supposed to be a job. I'm just saying, but back then they were trained in like knowing the word of God. Like they, they were required to know the word of God, like the back of their hand. It's kind of like going to seminary. I guess that'd be a better explanation. Um, so I like to ask these really pointed questions. Do you read your Bible every single day without fail? You can't say, yeah, well, sort of, yeah, most. No, it's either a yes or no question. You either do or you do not. And the purpose of this is the same thing as Romans 7 we talked about in the last video of it's showing their sin exceedingly sinful. You know, Jesus talks about how there'll be many that say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, and I'll say, depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. I never knew you. In the first two gospels alone, there's 36 accounts of Jesus talking to people about false conversion. 36 in the first two gospels, 36 times. In two gospels, 36 times. If you've ever heard of the parables, parable of the fish, parable of the talents, parable of the, the wheat um, and the tares, parable of the sower and the seed, parable of the, uh, the virgins, parable of the sheep, um, parable of the, the um, I think I said the sower and the seed. Um, those are just the six that come to the top of my head uh, right now. Um, there's some that I'm missing. But anyways, all of those parables are all about the exact same topic, false conversion. The parable of the prodigal son, right? The parable of the coin, lost coin, the parable of the lost sheep. It's all about false conversion. Every one of these, without fail, are all about false conversion. They're all about somebody who proclaimed the name of Jesus, somebody who believed that they were good to go, and they actually were unable to uh, inherit eternal life because of the way that they were living. Prodigal son story, right? Somebody who claims to be in the household of faith leaves and then comes back and asks for forgiveness, right? Parable in the sower of the seed. Seed is given on ground that is actually not fertile, meaning that they heard the word and they chose not to obey the word. They heard the word, understood the word, and didn't obey the word. That's what it specifies in Matthew 12 there. Point is, is all of these, the virgins, again, I'm not going to go through all of them to prove the point, but you can read them for yourself and see if I'm crazy. All of these have the purpose of showing somebody, hey, you are either doing spiritually well or you're not doing spiritually well. And Jesus talks about the separation from the sheep from the goats. Sheep being the true converts. Uh, I think that this is going to be right when the video is like swept around, but uh, this is my right hand. But the sheep in his right hand, the goats in his left hand, um, the goats are the ones who looked like the sheep, but they didn't do the will of their father. Many will come to me on that day. And say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not cast out demons in your name, prophesy in your name, and raise the dead? And he'll say, depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. I never knew you. Heavy words of Jesus. Um, this whole idea on this side here of 
You fed me when I was hungry. You gave me drink when I was thirsty. I was naked and you clothed me. In prison and you visited me. I was sick and you gave me help. And they're going to say, when do we see you that way? And Jesus is going to say, whatever you did unto the least of these, you did unto me. And then to the left hands, he's going to say, when I was hungry, you didn't feed me. Thirsty, you didn't give me drink. Naked, you didn't clothe me. Prison, you didn't visit me. And sick, you didn't come to me. And he's going to say, they're going to say, when did we see you that way? And he's going to say, whatever you did not do unto the least of these, you have not done unto me. Jesus is separating the sheep from the goats. These ones spend eternity apart from Jesus. The sheep spend eternity with Jesus. All of these are a warning to us to make sure that we're not living in deception. Read all of the letters to the churches, with the exception of really like Ephesians, they're all correcting their flawed understandings or beliefs or where people are going to be going eternally. And then look at Revelation. Just read the first three chapters. Don't even get into the crazy end time stuff. Just look at the first three chapters. It's all talking about the churches who are either doing well or not doing well spiritually. And, you know, that's where it talks about the lukewarm church. My favorite is Revelation 3.1 to the church of Sardis. I write, I know your reputation, that you have a reputation that you're alive, but you're dead. Repent and bring back to life the things which once were so that I can get you your white garments. I'm coming like a thief in the night. So um, all of these scriptures are around this concept of false converse. It is a massive theme throughout the entire Bible. I'll, I'll make, I don't know if I made a podcast on it yet, but I, I should make a podcast on this topic because it is a thick topic. I've done a tremendous amount of studying on it because I personally was one of those false converts. Thought I was saved because I went to church, but I actually wasn't because my far, heart was far from him. I professed him with my mouth, my heart was far from him. And it's really important that we speak to these people and we don't just hear, oh, you're a believer? Awesome, me too. My wife did amaz- this amazing thing. We were at Walmart um, a few weeks ago. And we walked up to a group of people and said, hey, do you need prayer for anything? And their response was, no, 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 no. We, we love Jesus, though. And my wife said, awesome, will you pray for us then? Because we always need prayer. And they were like, uh, uh, yeah, actually. And then they ended up praying. And ironically, these, they, they just didn't need any prayer. They were just thankful for what Jesus was doing in their life. They weren't doing it in like, a, oh, we're fine. We don't need prayer. They were just like, wow, God's blessed us. Like, I, I don't even need to ask for prayer for anything. Uh, and they were actually really solid, like really solid. We got to talk to them for like 40 minutes out in like 40 degree weather uh, outside of Walmart. And they prayed for us and commissioned us into Walmart to go preach Jesus to people because that's why we go to Walmart. Um, but yeah, my point in saying all of that is to say, don't just take somebody's word for it at face value. Oh, I'm a believer. So, so no, 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 no. You ask them questions. You need to provoke them. Um, but you also need to, uh, you know, again, if you're not going to specifically do that, you just need to uh, preach to them and let them know what they're called to do. This is what we see a lot of times done in scripture. We see it done both ways, right? Like Romans 2, you who say do not lie, do you lie? You who say don't commit adultery, do you commit adultery? Right? So Paul is reversing what their belief is on them to see if they're hypocrites with the way that they're living. Um, but then we see times in like, uh, uh, you know, later on where, where Paul is speaking with the, the um, other Jews and he's just letting them know what they need to know. He's not even debating. He's just letting them know and he walks away. Like Acts 28, last chapter of Acts, that, it's that, that's that way where he just preaches and leaves them to really think about and meditate on what he just said. And he's not arguing, debating, justifying. He just presents the truth and walks away. So um, that's another strategy you can use. But the point is you need to let them recognize God's standard versus the standard that they're living at so that they can be called up. It's not to discourage them, beat them down, condemn them, always give them hope. Let them know yeah, in the midst of you doing this, God's called us so much higher and we really can do this. We can live up to that standard. We just really need to, to step up and step out. So hopefully that's beneficial for you guys. Um, with that being said, um, I really appreciate uh, y'all's excitement and wanting to do all this evangelism stuff. So in the next one, you're actually going to get to see some real-time evangelism. Love y'all. We'll chat in the next one.